Right, uh, thank you very much everybody for joining us. My name is Kevin May. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Focuswire. Uh, this episode of New Reality With is brought to you by Salesforce. As many of you know, brands can harness the power of the Salesforce Customer 360 to deliver personalized experiences and build long-term traveler loyalty. Uh, our thanks to them once again for supporting our series of one-to-one -one interviews with industry leaders. This brings me very nicely to our industry leader for this particular episode. A very warm welcome uh, to Barbara Dalibard. Thank you very much for joining us, Barbara. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so a little bit of an introduction, if you can. So Barbara Dalibard, as you saw in the title screens, there is the CEO at CETA, which is, I'm told to say, one of the world's leading uh, airline and airport uh, technology providers. I don't think that's in any doubt. It is a role that Barbara's held uh, since joining the company in 2016. Uh, your career path is a mixture of transportation and telecoms, uh, having spent over half a decade prior to CETA at NCF, uh, the French rail operator. And prior to that, you were many years at Orange and also which was then known as France Telecom. So again, a warm welcome, Barbara from CETA. Thank you very much for joining us on New Reality With. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. So uh, this is a question that I've been asking uh, many of our guests that have been on this particular series. And we've kind of been getting the same answer, but I'm curious uh, to ask it each time, just in case we do get a different answer. And that is, you know, every company has a worst case scenario plan that they work towards, that they hope that they never have to implement. But I wonder, you know, given that we had a pretty bad case scenario probably prior to your time at SNCF with the, uh, the eruption of the Icelandic volcano in 2010. What level of planning and worst case scenario planning did CETA have in place for things that kind of came along? Yeah, we, what we do basically at CETA is every year we're, um, you know, stressing a little bit the company and looking at the kind of bad news that could impact us. You know, I, I have to say I was my image. I was lacking perhaps imagination because I was not thinking of a virus. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, so this is something we discussed with the board. And basically, we saw that uh, whatever you know event that could happen, we could resist very strongly to one crisis. If there are two crises or three crises, uh, it would be more difficult. We are, you know, mid-sized company. We are. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a presence in many, many places around the world, 170 countries and even more. But basically, we are, we are quite small. And the question is, when you have such a crisis, how can you resist? So we, we had this kind of exercise. So one crisis is fine, two is not. And this is why we don't want the pandemia to be back. But it will not be back because we take the right measures. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, have, we have some scenarios about that. And let's say that uh, even if we are at the kernel, really uh, uh, being, you know, in this industry and having uh, as customer the uh, uh, air transport industry, we are suffering, of course, a lot from a revenue standpoint. But basically, so far, we have been able to uh, uh, resist and show our resilience. So hopefully we land safely by the end of 20. Okay. Um, so that's the CETA perspective on this. Do you sense the airline partners and the airport partners that you have were similarly prepared or would you say it depends on a, a particular airline and the level of kind of foresight that they might actually have? I think that, you know, it's difficult to say that you are prepared to have a, a drop in your revenue of 90%, which right. is basically what happened worldwide. Okay, and if you compare the uh, the current crisis with the last crisis they have seen, uh, the financial crisis, it's uh, at least three to four times bigger. So I'm not sure they were prepared for a, a crisis, I would say, of these scales and of this speed. Because this happened in a couple of months. Okay, so you saw the revenue drop uh, from, let's say, uh, uh, the, ba the baseline to 10% uh, of the baseline within two months. So I'm sure they had some plans. Um, so basically here you can see what's happening. They need the support of uh, states or uh, whoever to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to be there. And uh, as I had said, I mean, and we see that at CETA, there are deaths uh, every day in this industry. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, we see that there will be, uh, 
you know, the next couple of years will not be as 19 was, meaning that there will be still a, a decline in the number of uh, passengers. But nevertheless, I think that uh, the industry has shown also its, its resiliency because they are still alive and they start to go back to, uh, to fly, which, which, is, which, is, which is good. But the overall impact will be, uh, the overall impact, you know, is really uh, something like 84 billion for the industry. 84 billion, it's a, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a figure that's quite, diff yeah. it's quite difficult to get your head around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You say, well, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to, uh, to manage such a crisis, yeah, of course. Yeah. Would you say, I mean, you've obviously, you've talked briefly a little bit about your own decision making and what CETA's has had to do. Would you say that um, as things unfolded, it would be fair to say that airlines and airports kind of coped with the crisis? For, I'm thinking from an operational perspective rather than a financial perspective. Would you say operationally that they dealt with what happened to them fairly well or not? Well, I think it's, um, well, it depends, I would say. And here you have all kinds of airports and airlines. I think if you look at, we had time, and it was true for CITA to adjust because even if it was a short time frame, you know, the crisis started in, uh, in China, in Asia, and it took a while until it reached uh, Europe and then, uh, you know, the Americas. So basically, if you look really at the weak signals and you analyze the situation, you can be prepared. And basically, if I take our example, we put people, uh, you know, uh, at home very early in the process before basically the lockdown of uh, the main European countries. Now, what you see also is the more digitalized the processes at the airport, the better they have managed uh, the company. You know, in a couple of days for this uh, airport that were well equipped, we have been able to remotely manage all the operation and make sure that our people and their people were safe. So basically, uh, the level of uh, digitalization has been absolutely key in order to uh, manage this crisis. Um, and, you know, I was really amazed by our capabilities. So we were at CETA implementing a very large project in, uh, in Korea, in South Korea, uh, at uh, Seoul Airport. And we have been able to uh, remotely support our teams. You know, usually at CETA, we have experts around the world. We fly the guys, they go there, they implement. And they were able, basically, to uh, uh, help Seoul uh, Airport to... to uh, uh, to be on track by, you know, remotely uh, accessing to the tools, helping the people on the site who are wearing masks and all kinds of, uh, of stuff in order to do it. So basically, I think that if you have automated your processes, if you have the right, you know, monitoring tools, and if you take the right decisions for your people, because they have to be on the safe side, then you could manage the situation. It has never been easy, but uh, it's what I saw. One could argue that the the other side of that coin is that if this particular crisis had happened 15, 20 years ago, then things may have actually been very different because there wasn't a level of digitalization. Yeah. So with that, yeah. scenario in, with that scenario in mind, I mean, how might it have um, panned out differently, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, uh, you know, globally, I would say, not speaking of the airline industry, it starts with uh, the usage of, you know, Zoom and Teams and uh, whatever tools we are using. Uh, honestly, uh, we were, you know, I was selling uh, video conferencing uh, years and 20 years ago already. I think I started selling video conferencing uh, in, uh, in uh, 90. So this is a long time ago with the first kind of device that were really uh, nice looking, but not very efficient. But if, we, if we, uh, we had not been able to use that, I mean, that the ability to work remotely and to put, you know, everybody at home would have been very different. So we start, you know, globally, I would say, we have benefited for, from that. And, um, and of course, uh, you know, at the airport, the issue would be that, you know, unfortunately, I guess we would have perhaps uh, more people infected, uh, more cases, um, Perhaps the traffic was lower, so the spread would have been lower. I don't know, but uh, basically it would have been uh, very different, yeah. Um, I, I, I must ask, because you just mentioned about the, the first video conferencing that you were talking about 25 years ago, did you envisage it being anything like Zoom that we're using now? 
No, no. I mean, I can tell you, it was something that uh, it was before internet. Huh? Uh, okay. It was before. It was in uh, in ninety. Uh, so here, it's uh, we are speaking thirty years ago. So it was a kind of machine, very nice. I think we were uh, selling it to some. Uh, You know, it was in, a, I don't know if you know Paris, there is La Défense where you have all the businesses yep. and they want, you know, to, to attract all the nice companies, including coming from the Gulf. So they had this kind of very uh, black uh, with golden stuff, you know, uh, uh, machines with a small screen and uh, they wanted to implement it in their offices to uh, enable people and CEOs to have chat between uh, one tower and the other. And I was, you know... Uh, We were designing it with our labs at, at Orange at that time, so it was fun. But uh, okay. yeah, so but it was the first step of video, so it was working. Huh? But uh, the quality was not there, and of course, it was not used by uh, everybody in a company. Just a couple of uh, happy few. Right, I suppose if we'd gone back to the future from us now into 1990, Marty McFly style, and you'd have seen 20 people on a screen, you probably would have thought well yeah. that actually is going to end up okay isn't it but anyway yeah. we could talk about that for a long time but we, you are here to talk about uh, airlines and airports so with the existing technology services that you provide to uh, I, i guess airports in particular were there any that you had to adapt during that initial outbreak phase just to kind of figure things out i know you referenced a little bit about the, the, yeah. the korean situation but so uh, what else would What other kind of examples were things that you had to adapt really quickly to take advantage or well, to think, cope with yeah, what was going yeah. on? So the first thing was really to adapt the, um, you know, the operations at the airport, making sure that we could remotely address uh, the main processes at the airport, monitor you know, the services. And this has been done quite uh, quickly. We had these two uh, big centers, uh, one in Singapore, one in Montreal. And uh, people were able to, you know, access to the different apps and monitor a lot of stuff. Not everything, but I would say uh, certainly 90% of the application allowing really the, uh, the customer to proceed. Then we have been able to do that at home, which was the next step. Okay. And um, basically, I think but this is a, a generic uh, issue uh, at CITA we develop software. And, and the, the next, uh, the next uh, step would be to uh, put people at home and make sure that they can uh, continue the development that were needed, once again, to help our customer to get the right services during the crisis. And there were many requests coming. Of course, when the traffic is null, I mean, you don't have many requests. But basically, the issue is how do we prepare for the new normal, what's going to happen, what's happening now, and how do we adjust our products? The good thing is we have a lot of things in our uh, portfolio that were already very, uh, I would say, meaningful for the industry going forward, and we'll give some examples perhaps. Um, but we were accelerating the features that were really uh, enabling, let's say, a seamless, pass a seamless touchless passenger journey at the airport. And we have done that also remotely through the tools. I think many IT companies have done that. I mean, this is a... This is, uh, you know, our bread and butter to develop stuff, So, uh, but we have been able to do it. The issue was also to make sure that we are keeping, you know, the contact with our customers. So, you know, of course, the airline industry was very different. So making sure that we were very um, close to the customer on a daily basis to address their immediate needs at the airport uh, or for the aircraft, but also um, understanding, you know, their plans in order to adjust our own plans and making sure that we could help them to weather the storm. So it has been different from one company to the other. We have seen, as I said, some companies dying from that, and it's perhaps not over, but basically making sure that we could, you know, uh, try to adjust our offers in order to mitigate uh, uh, the different needs they, they could express. So, you know, and, and they would, could be financial needs, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of stuff. And what, what would you say, Barbara, has perhaps been some of the biggest lessons that the airlines and the airports have learned during, this out, during the outbreak phase that they are going to take forward? I mean, there's some of the things that you've referenced there, but is there anything or one single one that you could identify that has come back I from your discussions is, with you know, customers? Yeah. I think what is interesting, you know, I, I will try to uh, summarize that before the crisis, 
the issue for the airport and the airlines was the congestion at the airport. Right. You know, there were these very nice curves of uh, IATA saying that traffic will double, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, I mean, you could trust it or have doubts, whatever, but at the end, this is what everybody had in mind, and you had some airports with where the, the number of passengers were such that you could not handle it. What is really interesting is now we have a different fi- we have different figures in terms of passenger, but the issue to optimize the processing of a given passenger within the airport is even more needed. Okay, so basically, okay. Uh, if I come back to that, you know, I, I'm going to, um, to 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 give one example. Is really how can you have really a seamless passenger experience and touchless? So here at CETA, we have two beliefs. The first one is your mobile should be your remote control for travel. And through the new platform, you should enable airports, airlines to access, let's say, to the platform and provide a service to the passenger that is really using his or her mobile. And then, you know, you use your mobile to go through the different steps of, of, of the journey. The second one is biometry. So there were already some plans, but obviously we see that through the crisis, the acceleration of biometry will happen. Uh, And here it's your face is your boarding pass, basically. So how can you really push that forward quickly in order to make sure that many operations, many processes can be, you know, done outside the airport, registering your face on the mobile, you know, uh, downloading the app, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then when you are at the airport, you really go quickly through the different processes, you know, touchless bag uh, tags, everything. So you don't touch anything. You own your mobile. It's yours, so it's safe. Okay. And you, uh, you optimize it. Uh, one other example of, of this is basically we had some, uh, we have some, uh, I would say, products at CITA to help the uh, airport to manage crowds. Okay. So it was interesting because before the issue was, you know, I don't want to have a kind of bottleneck at a given gate. Now it's different. You want to manage a crowd, but you want to make sure that you uh, can measure social distancing. You want to make sure that you, Kevin, are wearing your mask. Okay. And so you need to use computer vision a little bit with the same spirit but with some additional features in order to make sure that the airport can monitor the fact that here there is a guy that is not wearing a mask or here at this gate, people are not respecting, you know, uh, uh, the distances that they are supposed to respect. So basically it's interesting because once again, we had in the portfolio uh, many of these enablers and now what we are doing is as quickly as we can to integrate those little features in order to meet make it even more meaningful for the future. I don't know if I'm clear. You stop me. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's crystal clear. And we'll come back to some of those in a moment, Barbara. I mean, before we move on to, you know, we've just been covering the, that kind of the outbreak phase of all this. Yeah. Um, but before we move on, it's a fairly political question. But would you have, you know, if you were in a position where you had um, uh, this level of uh, kind of influence, would you have insisted on masks, for example, being worn by passengers a lot earlier than, you know, it was only at the phase when airlines were talking about yeah. restarting that the question of masks came up when, you know, masks have been around for a very long time. I mean, would you have sensed that those should have been introduced yeah. a little bit earlier? You know, at CITA, I am known for that because, you know, I'm pushing people and, uh, you know, uh, I am living with scientists, so I'm reading a lot, you know, the uh, literature and uh, quite Quite quickly, it was obvious that the mask, even if they are not the solution to everything, you know, basically they decrease uh, the contamination. And if you decrease the contamination, you decrease the pandemia uh, by design. So it's, there is this famous R0, whatever it's called, you can decrease yeah. it. So it's, it's absolutely needed. And even if your mask is not perfect, you know, we are always you know, uh, doing our own mask, uh, um, it's, it's, it's better to uh, wear a mask than not to wear one. So, uh, yes, I think to your point, I mean, um, you know, in, in my home country, there were some issues about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, there were the, the mask, uh, people were thinking, well, it's not uh, useful, they, they had been burned, they were perhaps obsolete, whatever. At the end, you know, I think the lesson is we need to wear a mask when there is a pandemic and the virus is, is out of control. 
it's not solving everything. You know, some people will still be sick, but you decrease a lot the risk and, uh, uh, you know, you decrease the number of deaths. So here it's like uh, wearing a safety belt, you know, uh, we don't like it. You know, this is part of the discussion I have as, I have as a manager. Some people don't like it. They don't like to drive, you know, uh, uh, or you don't like to, uh, to uh, have a helmet when you are, you, are, you, are, you are biking. But nevertheless, by doing that, even if it's not nice, I mean, you decrease your risk. So uh, I think as manager and as politicians, by the way, we need to decrease the risk. Yeah. It's our okay. Decision. If we can move forward a bit to where we are kind of now, really, which is this, you know, we are starting certainly in Europe and in, in other, uh, Asia is you know, quite a few months ahead of us. But, uh, you know, airlines are trying to get back on their feet and they're yeah. restarting services. Um, some of the biggest carriers, you know, where you and I are in Europe, EasyJet and Ryanair, they've, they're, you know, they're, they're tentatively starting to reintroduce their, 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 their network back to where it was. I mean, what are you what are you hearing back from your airline and airport customers around the kind of changing consumer or passenger behavior that they are starting to see and yeah. how do you see looking forward that might influence your own technology roadmap at CETA and how it applies to airlines and airports Perhaps, uh, you know, if I may, I would like to give a couple of numbers of, you know, uh, the, the traffic and see, you know, uh, how yeah. the passenger behave because it's a good signal. So at CITA, you know, we are following that uh, very carefully on a daily basis, looking at the figures. And, uh, you know, as I said, uh, the traffic worldwide was uh, down by nearly, uh, you know, 90% at a given point. So May was 80 and June was 69 worldwide. Um, and now, if I take last week, it was 62. So the good news is, you know, the traffic is ramping up, especially domestic and regional traffic, as you mentioned, Kevin. And uh, if just to give you two numbers, long haul, it was uh, last week uh, minus 74, so we compare to 19, and short haul, 59. So you see that, obviously, uh, domestic travel is going back. So you see... I have taken, uh, you know, uh, I have been in place uh, three or four times since the, you know, the the fact that they are st they are uh, back 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 and flying. What is interesting, I don't see people scared. Everybody is very uh, is wearing mask. This is what I am told. The main thing, and it was mentioned by one of our board members yesterday, is the relationship with food is different. The service is different. So basically, when you look at the airlines, they are obviously, uh, you know, I don't have the sample of uh, all airlines, changing um, uh, the way food is provided within the aircraft. So basically, in some cases, they have stopped the service. In some cases, because they want to uh, really minimize the risk. In some cases, they go back to uh, simple things that are safe. Uh, and people, I think, buy less. This I have seen also, and this what I was told. Uh, because once again, they prefer to uh, bring their own uh, little sandwich, I think, than uh, buying within the aircraft. Except for that, I see a lot of discipline, but once again, you know, uh, and I'm not hearing from the airlines anything uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, I think people are quite confident that with the mask, they are okay. So uh, we will see in the traffic, of course, uh, if there will be some changes. And as we know, you know, once again, uh, the, the, the forecasts are, you know, showing the fact that 21 will be, uh, will not be like 19 and it will take three or four years to go back to the previous level. But the passengers who are boarding the, the aircraft, they behave, I would say, normally. I'm not hearing any, anything special. Of course, they are happy with no, if nobody is sitting uh, by their side. But this right. is the same issue in the train. You know, people don't like to have somebody sitting uh, just by them. Yeah, but, I suppose. You know, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I suppose a byproduct that I hadn't thought about until now, I'm sure much smarter people than I have already, but you know, I wonder what this will do to the, to ancillary revenues, because as you say, yeah. you know, airlines have been massively reliant. Some have been reliant and some have been enjoying 
huge numbers and increases yeah. in ancillary revenue over the yeah. last couple yeah. of years. And if that's going to go down, interesting point. So, no, um, and this can do that, yeah, I think so. Yeah, in, interestingly, I mean, to tie it in, uh, this morning, um, we're going to go back to kind of what you said a moment ago about biometrics. So this morning, CETA announced a deal with NEC yeah. in, in yeah. Japan. Um, I'm more than happy for you to talk about that deal. So congratulations. But I mean, I think the wider context of that is quite interesting. It goes back, as I said, to, to biometrics. Do you sense, obviously, your deal will help with this, but at, at an industry level, we are going to see an acceleration in biometrics. You gave us, uh, you know, your kind of perspective on what it actually is and how it will work. But is this going to accelerate the adoption of biometrics as as a as a tool for passenger uh, I, experience? I, I do think I do think so. Basically, you know, uh, first, I mean, airports and airlines had some project because once again, it was speeding up some processes, allowing once again a seamless passenger journey um, and helping them to manage more passengers. Here, it's also an health issue. So uh, yes, they, uh, when you talk to, a, when I was talking to a group of customers recently, they said this will be a major for them to make sure that they can implement biometry as quickly as possible. And, and that's why, you know, we, we have been working at CITA a lot about that. Uh, we know it's, uh, you know, it's, it's simplifying also the customer experience, mm -hmm. uh, automating some uh, key processes you need to do that uh, ethically, and it's one of my key, uh, I would say, battle uh, in this industry, making sure that, you know, we are not, uh, nobody's playing with uh, your biometric data. But if you do that well, I think it's a key enabler, and uh, they are all, you know, all investing in this area. And uh, why NEC? It's because basically we've been working with them, and they have a very accurate technology when it comes to biometry. So, uh, you know, with our presence at the airport, our knowledge of the processes and their very strong, uh, uh, very strong, I would say, technical uh, uh, advantage from, uh, once again, accurate system point, which is very much needed. We thought it was a good deal, so we are working with them on that. Okay, so uh, investing in this area is uh, a few words that you yeah. just said there. You're investing in this area, yeah. which is which is great but we now get down to the really important part of this is that airlines and airports have to invest as well there's lots of technology that we're talking about here that's going to be great for passenger experience uh, there are health considerations that will need to be accounted for but who how does this all kind of work out in the financial kind of sense of all this because uh, you know the last time I looked, many airlines are, uh, are experiencing some, some fairly troubling financial problems of their own. I mean, how are they going to have to prioritize this? Do they have to pick and choose which things are going to be um, more important? Or is it when they are state-owned airlines and state-owned airports that that's another consideration that's going to need to be unraveled? It's a fairly complicated part of all this is the cost effectiveness versus the yeah. the fact that they are going to have to do some of this. And what are your kind of thoughts on the financial aspect of how so, all this gets paid for? From, from the financial aspect, I would say broadly, when you look at the airlines at the airport, the request they will have for us is you need to do much more for much less. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, the important is really the efficiency and making sure that you can provide a good return on investment um, by design. I think, you know, the exercise we are doing at CETA and that all our, I would say, IT colleagues, CIOs of the airlines and airports are doing is basically reprioritize, to your point, the roadmap. This is not needed really now in this time of crisis. This can live as it is. So we focus all the investment on the new things that are absolutely needed, okay? Second thing is when you look at biometry, it's also a kind of partnership, if I may, between the airlines and the government. There is an interest when you look at the process, you know, at the customs. It's basically as much uh, an airline uh, investment as uh, uh, a government investment. And if they uh, share, I would say, their strengths, they can go quicker. Um, so basically, I think there will be, and, 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 and last but not least, you know, it's like in technology, you have the more law all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you implement a lot of... Uh, a lot of device of this kind, I mean, you decrease uh, the unit cost. 
So, uh, and, and there are already some solutions that are not that expensive. So basically the question is how can you enhance your process, you know, streamline your operations and uh, invest the right money with the right ROI and I'm sure we can find solutions for the airlines for that. Once again, with the government, so it's a mix between airport, government and airlines. What is important is not only the machines, it's basically agreeing on standards. Uh, and IATA is working on that, but you know, I've been a very strong advocate of, of that since I joined CETA. Things will work if and only if, and you can reduce investment, people work together. And this is really our DNA at CETA to make sure that uh, airline X can uh, talk to airline Y, uh, government Z with the government A in a seamless way to make sure that the investment is optimized. If you need to invest, you know, this kind of equipment uh, for uh, this airline and then you have to change, then it will be, uh, it will be, uh, it will be uh, more costly. So standards, so, you know, it's not the machine, it's basically what we call the API. The way we communicate together has to be uh, organized across the, uh, uh, the industry. And I think at CETA, we can be a key enabler for that. Okay, so let's um, let's kind of move into our final part of the uh, of our discussion here, Barbara, if we can, and that's kind of really looking forward now, and a, a broad range of kind of topics that I'd like to I'd like to cover if we if we could. Um, this kind of comes back to what we were just discussing with the, the the payment part of this, but you know there is there is going to be a lot of collaboration required whether that's from airlines and uh, airports government authorities health authorities things like that but also the wider travel industry is probably going to need to be a part of this and i'm thinking you know the intermediaries travel agencies that sell tickets air tickets on behalf of their customers now they are not famously in the industry known for collaborating Whose yeah. role is it to kind of enforce that? Is it, or to push those ideas of collaboration forward? Is it the likes of IATA, or is it at a uh, at, a, at a kind of a, a WTO level, or is it you know, an EU level, or something like that? How does that all kind of get worked out? Well, I'm not sure there is a simple answer to your question. IATA certainly, and you know, I, th I think Alexandre Junac mentioned it uh, recently. Is yeah. here to make sure that you know is they are pushing standards once again to enable this kind of processes across the industry. You know, if you look at organization, you know, about the tourism, travel, all these, all these organizations have the same interest. If you want to make sure that, you know, people go back uh, and continue to travel, we need to have standards. And at CETA, we are more, I would say, the arm to implement, to make sure that we can, I mean, participate into this discussion and we do it but also are able, because we have a worldwide presence, to implement this kind of thing. So basically, it's a, but let me take one example. We are implementing, so we are very strong on the border, uh, you know, uh, uh, border side to try to help government to manage, you know, the passenger at the border. So uh, we have been quite quick, you know, I remember I was traveling to uh, Montreal uh, just at the beginning of the crisis, and within 48 hours, we put on our system a question saying, uh, have you been uh, visiting Wuhan recently? So it was, it was done within a weekend. We need to implement in the border system uh, a kind of health passport to uh, make sure that, you know, uh, we, we, we are safe to travel. It's important, I think, that we, we align, you know, everybody can have ideas of what kind of things you need on the health passport, and we can adjust. But basically, it would be simpler um, if, as part of the advanced passenger process, we have one kind of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, uh, questionnaire that would be the same in every country to make sure that your cabin can travel safely because, you know, you have been immunized or whatever. Uh, and this is exactly what's happening for other diseases like the uh, yellow fever or this kind of thing. So basically, we need people to uh, talk. And the good thing is during a crisis, people talk. They change their mindset. We see that also at the airport, you know, between the security guys, we are not discussing with the airport guys. They start talking together to optimize, to your point, the investment. So we need them to talk, and then we need to surf on this wave and, 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 and provide the right services. So uh, the border example is a good one. 
uh, processes will change. Uh, it's a little bit like 9-11. Uh, we need to integrate in the processes some new checks, health checks. How can we do that, you know, in the same way everywhere to facilitate the passenger journey? Okay. And, you know, certainly for a few years, Barbara, you couldn't attend a travel conference or, you know, a, a webinar without somebody mentioning blockchain. And, uh, you know, yeah. often yeah. it would, often people's eyes would glaze over a little bit because it was something that yeah. either people frankly didn't understand or they yeah. just didn't see the relevance of it. And there is perhaps a sense that now is where something like blockchain, where there is going to be a lot more passing of data between providers where blockchain might have its opportunity to come to the fore. Would you agree with that or do you still think Absolutely. it is? Absolutely. And you know, okay. <laughs> since I joined CETA, you know, uh, I was pushing a lot because blockchain is really done. And I'm not speaking of the B2C uh, blockchain, let's say, I would say the uh, Bitcoin stuff, huh? but B2B, <laughs> making sure that you can uh, validate some or share some processes uh, between different actors in the industry in a safe way, confidential way, protecting the rights of the passengers. So a couple of examples. We are a founder of the Sovereign um, uh, you know, uh, Foundation. Basically, it's about making sure that, uh, Kevin, your data, you know, you are, you, are, it's, uh, you are managing your own data and using the blockchain scheme because you have a favorite relationship with uh, whatever airline and your government, you know, are validated and can be used by anybody who uh, needs to use it with your consent, by the way, uh, along, the, along the way. So using blockchain for, you know, uh, the biometric data, I think it makes a lot of sense and we are pushing for that. You, uh, you can speak of, you know, uh, it's one of my um, obsessions at a given point was, you know, if you are a passenger, you have certainly seen that Sometimes if you compare the website of the uh, airport, the airline, uh, uh, the mobile site, which can be different from the website, and you are looking at delays, uh, you can have all kinds of different information for the same flight and the same airport. Okay, mm -hmm. so having one information, so we put in the flag, flight chain, and we have uh, created at CETA a sandbox to have the airlines and, and airports working on it, where people share data about this flight, there were so many passengers, you know, in this flight, you cannot imagine the number of people working around the planet to check the number of passengers per flight. You know, this data is, is known, you know, but uh, there are discussions everywhere because it's uh, one of the uh, topics between airports and airlines, you know, they build by passenger. So having one data somewhere in a blockchain that can be shared in a meaningful way is also very uh, useful. You can speak of, uh, you know, aircraft parts. There are many use cases, and at CETA we are, you know, this is really something where we invest. Um, and once again, it's a great tool for collaboration and a safe tool for collaboration. And without, by the way, the, uh, let's say, uh, energy, uh, if you do it on, in a B2B uh, environment, it's not like the Bitcoin, every time you, uh, you do a transaction, it's like, uh, you know, <laughs> <I don't> know <laughs> for 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 12 months or whatever uh, really here it's uh, reasonable because you have just some key partner checking your data and saying yes i agree kevin is, is really kevin okay last time i looked i was definitely kevin so that's good to know so i i, I, I like your your quote the bitcoin stuff <laughs> i think that's a <laughs> we should all call it that from now onwards anyway right what would you say then barbara and uh, as we kind of get towards the end here Many people still say it's the airport experience, which is perhaps travel's biggest pain points that still needs to be solved. Would you agree with that? And I know we've we've talked extensively here about the different things that are going to perhaps make um, the post-COVID world a little easier to handle. But is that it's such a, a pain for people? Do you do you think that's the biggest one that still needs to be solved? Yeah, I think in travel, you know, it's interesting. When I was, you, you mentioned the fact that I was in the railways, I did some studies about the stress of the passenger through the, uh, the journey and the, the maximum stress was at, at the station. So basically why? It's because you want to make sure that you go through the process, you know, you, uh, you arrive in your train or in your aircraft. Uh, so yes, I mean, it's creating, uh, it's a, it can be for some people, you know, if you are 
older, if you have a large family, if you are in a rush, uh, create a kind of stressful environment. So, but the good news is the more you automate the process, the more the passenger is in the driving seat, the happier he or she is. And we have measured that at CITA. So for instance, if you use, uh, let's say, a self-backdrop, touchless, uh, you know, back tagging uh, uh, enabled, then you are much happier than if you have to uh, queue, uh, go to the, uh, you know, uh, go to the desk, uh, put your uh, suitcase. So I think that once again, we are speaking of digitalization of, of the airport. The more we do that, the more you can concentrate the employees for the benefit of the people who have a need for that, you know, older, handicapped, you know, large families, whatever. And the more people like, I guess, yourself, myself, we can go through the different, uh, I would say, steps at the airport in a seamless way and uh, perhaps spend more time uh, buying things at the duty-free. So, um, yes, I think, you know, it's... Uh, uh, the arrival and the departure are the key element of the, the journey. Yes, it's perceived as such. It's not because stress is created there, but it's, it's a little bit painful because people are anxious. And, but there are tools in order to facilitate that. And this is really what we are doing at, at CITA, providing to the airport, you know, uh, the tools and the monitoring tools, the dashboard, to make sure that they can simplify the customer experience and uh, make it really uh, enjoyable. And two areas that CETA isn't directly involved in is the cruise industry and hotels. Um, if you were uh, asked by your board to look at those sectors and build tools for those particular sectors, what, would you, what are some of the things that you think would be useful things for CETA to build for those particular sectors? Hotels, I don't know. I mean, cruise, you know, we, we are working, you know, on the cruise and the railways. We have a couple of customers uh, worldwide on these two industries because they are very, you know, very adjacent to our business. It's travel, basically, and some of the processes, for instance, you know, I remember taking a cruise a long time ago with my kids, uh, you know, to pass the border in Canada. You have to do more or less the same thing, uh, uh, than the thing you are doing at the airport. So the same processes apply and we can certainly uh, leverage some of our tools. And you know what? Uh, some of our board members are telling us you should do it. So uh, we are doing it. So when, when relevant, we do apply. Hotels are a little bit different because the process itself is, is, is a little bit different. Uh, you don't, you don't, oh, the health check could be perhaps meaningful. I'm just trying to think it's, it's, it's further. But crews, you know, railways where you have to uh, follow a passenger, make sure that they follow security, health uh, checks, whatever. Yes, that, that's very meaningful. And, and, and last of all, Barbara, I mean, if, um, if we were lucky enough to be talking in a couple of years' time on a similar interview like this, what would you, um, I mean, obviously, we, we always have to say this with the caveat, you know, it's, it's been an overwhelmingly tragic year for you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, many people have died. There are millions of people that have suffered from this who are still gravely ill and things, you know, th th that awful side of the pandemic. But if we, were to, if we had to just talk specifically about the industry, what would be your overwhelming emotion if someone said to you, 2020 when you were or maybe still are CEO of CETA what would be your overriding emotion but when you look back to this particular year from an industry perspective forgetting if we may momentarily the health well matter. I mean uh, once again I, I can speak CETA and the industry uh, one of my key focus is to make sure that I can once again I mean uh, this kind of economical crisis you don't see twice I hope in your life um, I think employment is key, and I think that, of course, given uh, the numbers, I mean, uh, many companies have to take some uh, decisions that are very hard on people. At CITA, my objective is to try to uh, make sure we can find all kinds of solutions to, uh, and once again, you know, keep employment as, you know, as good as possible for the people. So once again, it's not easy. We need to decrease our cost. But I think that, you know, I consider that it's my duty to contribute to the economy because the more you lay off people, the more you accelerate the uh, economical crisis. 
So how can we share the work in order to, uh, to do that better? And of course, you know, I know it's not applicable everywhere, and I know that some uh, strong decisions have to be taken, but really this is what is uh, obsessing me a little bit at night to make sure that I can uh, contribute there. Uh, you know, I think that what we have seen is cooperation. What I've seen, and, and this I will remember positively, uh, once again, uh, you know, there were some uh, uh, you know, tiring moments. Uh, uh, people have been sick at CETA. I have, you know, uh, some in my family, my son uh, was sick also. So, I mean, of course, uh, they were fully, uh, uh, they are still there, but, uh, but I know how uh, painful it has been. I think, but what was really impressive was to see the level of collaboration between the teams, the ability mm -hmm. to work differently together. And, uh, you know, I will take an example that really I, I love that CETA is, you know, of course, people who are working remotely. And if you have small kids at home, uh, you don't know how to work because, you know, uh, you, they are around. So they organize themselves in order to have one of them telling stories to the kids using Zoom teams or whatever, while the parents of the others were working. So they have found ways. It's a small example. But, you know, I've... I've seen solid solidarity uh, between the teams, cooperation that was more difficult to implement before. And I think that if we can be, um, you know, uh, use this crisis to learn uh, not only within companies, but uh, across the world to, uh, to have a better world, that would, be, uh, that would be good. You know, I'm, a, I'm a, an optimistic person. It, it's interesting, perhaps, uh, you know, I guess a final word from us on FocusWire as well. It's, it's interesting that, despite everything and with such a technology based kind of industry that there are some very human things yeah. that have come out of this that we hope that will uh, continue to go forward. So uh, yeah. um, a, a very warm thank you to uh, everyone for tuning in. Uh, thanks again to uh, Barbara Dalabad of CETA. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me remind you that this episode of New Reality With was brought to you by Salesforce. As we said at the top of today's interview, you can harness the power of the Salesforce Customer 360 to deliver personalized experience and build long-term traveler loyalty. We'll put a link to where you can find out more about that uh, on the article for the replay that will be on uh, uh, YouTube and on focuswire.com tomorrow. We also recently published uh, an in-depth interview with Salesforce about the communications that they were uh, using with through their partners uh, during COVID-19 and beyond. This is actually a really good interview and learned quite a lot. So many thanks to them, of course. Uh, uh, enormous thanks to you, Barbara from CETA, for joining us for this, uh, uh, this interview for New Reality With. We really appreciate your time. Stay well and best of luck for the future. And thank you very much again. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks. Thank you very much.